Hello. Uh, hello. Everyone. So I'm Matt, and this is James. We're two members of Assemble. Uh, we're a collective that work across the fields of architecture, art, and design. First of all, thank you to the Make a Difference team and Samson Wong for inviting us out here and being such good hosts while we're here. Um, we'd like to talk tonight about the core interests that have developed um, as we've worked together over the past five years, things that we feel are important in our work. And we've chosen three projects um, that we're going to talk about because we feel that they have some resonance with the situations we've seen in our short time in Hong Kong in our workshops at the Make a Different School, um, both in um, Ping Te and also in um, Team So Wai. Oops. Um, so there's three themes generally that I'd like to talk about. The first is in the development of alternative methods of practice, so those which try to better mediate between the designer or the architect and the society in which we act. And then there's an interest in physically making things. And thirdly, an exploration of the limits of our agency as designers, where our role, our responsibility in a project, in a particular context, where it might start and where it might end. And so we'd like to explore these three themes through three projects. But firstly, just to give a little bit of an introduction as to how we, as Assemble, came to work together, um, it's probably uh, useful for me to talk about one projects in particular. So the majority of the group studied together, most of us were architects, um, and there was a common sentiment as students that throughout our education the, we see architecture as a, you know, a critical and a public and a social practice. Um, but when we began working as architectural assistants, the opportunities to work in this way were very scarce, and the economy, ec economy sorry, was generally um, a bit of a mess and there's a lack of optimism about the future. And these kind of issues are also compounded with the fact that when you're working, when you're in practice, the reality is that you're sat behind a desk most of the time, and it's an existence kind of lived through drawings through a computer. And this is, above all, frustrating, because whilst there is obviously a reason to work like this and a practicality in, in that way of working, we also felt that it's not the only way of acting, it's not the only way of learning, um, you know, it's not the only way... To, um, to design. And so this initiation also threw up opportunities as well as challenges. So the collapse in land values in London meant that it was littered with development sites that were you know, empty, they were stored development. So one of them we were able to borrow for a short time for a self-initiated project called the Cinerolium, a project which conceived of at weekends and evenings and it gradually took the idea of the form of a cinema in this abandoned petrol station. And without a budget, save so a very small arts grant, um, we had to construct the project ourselves from utilitarian materials that were lent, um, donated, scavenged, um, and not very often bought. So it's a project with a very different kind of economy. Um, and that economy is one of many hands. Uh, and hands that maybe weren't the most skilled, but they were willing and they're willing not only to construct and to build, but to uh, program the films, to run the bar, to clear up every night, and to be on hand in every situation, including in the raising of the curtain at the end of the shows. And so it was a project without a client or without a brief. It didn't have an imperative. So it's not a conventional one by any means, but it kind of sets the tone for a lot of our future explorations. Um, we had the opportunity to test some of these ideas about the role that people can play um, in the shaping of their built environment in, in a town called New Addington. Um, New Addington was, was a new town built in outer London in the 1930s. Um, it was only partially completed without proper transport connections to London. Um, so consequently, it's had a difficult history with few opportunities for employment or entertainment. Um, in the summer of 2011, there were some the riots in London. Uh, these were followed by a kind of a programme to improve high streets in areas of outer London that had been kind of the worst affected. Um, and in Addington, shops had been burned down, and there was a genuine hostility between the local youths and the community at large. And within this context, Central Parade, the main kind of focal point of the town, the centre of the, the planning, um, was not seen as social or civic, but as an empty and potentially dangerous place. 
New Addington had suffered from plenty of false promises in the past. Lots of consultations had raised hopes, but nothing, nothing had happened. Um, locals described it as a kind of promise fatigue. Um, and the general feeling was that nothing had happened in Addington for years in the past, and nothing was really going to happen in the future. Through some of the temporary projects we'd done, the Cinerolium and, and several others since, um, in between these, these projects, um, we'd come to understand the, the sort of the value and the time involved in developing relationships with people that were trying to improve things in the local area already. So we moved our office to Addington once we, we got this job, um, working out of the local community centre for several months from the start. And this meant that people could drop in and discuss things outside of normal meetings, normal consultations, and the sort of formal processes. Um, and that was really important to try to get a sense of what people valued about the area, but were not talking about, because the problems were the urgent issue, and those are the things that everyone wanted to kind of raise to be, make sure that those things were being heard. Um, but there was evidently a very strong sense of community spirit. Lots of very popular activities that were happening weekly. The community regularly came together to put on big events at Christmas and in the summer. So one of the things we produced was a complete timetable of all the events that were happening in Addo every week. It showed a lot was going on, but at that time none of it was very visible at all. And the project brief initially was to improve Central Parade with some new building works and then organise a festival that would celebrate the, the ma marvellous new built works once that stuff was complete. But instead of drawing up the designs first, we produced the festival to demonstrate that this discussion was different from the ones that had gone before, to show that things were happening and that it was important that people were involved in these sets of conversations about the future. So a very practical piece of work initially identified some design issues with the way the existing space worked, set out a kind of a template. So the, scale, the square was being used as free parking, the market was very disorganised, um, the road between the square and the shops was dangerous because cars were just whiz along it very fast, and it all felt very municipal and harsh. So we proposed some simple design changes to make the square a shared surface with the, with the, the pedestrian shop route, built a low bench height brick wall and planted trees that together helped to separate the square from the car parks on either side, covering two large drains which were the main feature of the, the square as it was, um, and, and instead replaced these with a, a timber stage for public events and a playable piece of landscape that could be used for skating and things. But we also proposed to host all the popular activities out in the square. So we spoke to all the organisers of the regular events with the market management and the local gym, which is very popular with the youths, and built a stage set to support them, a series of kind of tests at one-to-one -one that we, we kind of marketed to the people. We sort of described it to them as this try-before-you-buy urbanism, so they could sort of see what they were going to get um, and, and, and kind of criti critique it, let us know how they felt. And this wasn't particularly helpful as a design tool, um, but this consultation through use was very visible and it gathered a lot of momentum behind the project and really promoted the ideas that this square, rather than being this kind of you know, symbol of the emptiness and, and, and fear and hostility of the place, could be a lively public space that could be the heart of the civic and social life of Addington's residents. That it could help the shops by kind of bringing more footfall and things like that. And it also served as strong evidence that physical changes could prompt and encourage different sets of behaviour that would help to convince people that some of the changes they were less sure about in the design, such as moving the market and, and just changing things, you know, people are often unsure about that. So this kind of empirical way of testing the designs that we were coming up with was, you know, was very important. Um, the surrounding area has a lot of variety in its kind of character and detail that was totally absent, this kind of level of care that was totally absent from the square itself. Lots of things in the, the kind of the brick walls and the gardens and the, the way people have kind of furnished their own homes and the frontages, they're all very different. And we tried to bring this level of care through in the new square. Um, really consider sort of bringing richer materials, polished concrete copings to a new boundary wall. Copying some of the brick wall bonds and things that people had done on their own front garden walls. Um, and taking the, the herringbone floor pattern from the community hall, uh, in, which is an inside space, and bringing that outside into the square. Planting tree species from the surrounding avenues uh, that would screen the, screen the square from the car park and make it feel like a, a sort of clearly defined space in its own right. And when it was built, the final part of the project was to, to have this, you know, the second part of the festival to kind of showcase um, the new public space, activate it, and, and that was a big success. Um, but the management of the space throughout hadn't really been set in stone. We were still doing a lot of this organising, um, which meant that when our involvement in the project ended, the space hadn't necessarily been used as much as it could have in, in the period since. Those kind of rules and uh, things hadn't necessarily been worked out as well as they should have been um, because it was outside of our role as the kind of architect for the project at that point. Um, and the project certainly did improve things, but it was also a lesson in the limitation of our own agency about responsibility, 
um, and about our role in the different situations we work in. How engagement in giving people a group of, uh, you know, you can engage people in one way through this kind of set of events, you can put on things for them, but that's a very different thing to, to giving them real empowerment and ownership over that space. Um, those are considerations that we've tried to deal with and differently and do better in a number of projects going forward. Um, so Matt's going to talk about one of those now, which is Black Horse Workshop. So in Black Horse Workshop, there's this question of legacy that James is talking about, but also of direct action. So direct action being a kind of necessity uh, in our first projects. Um, and it's also a tactic that James described there that we used in New Addington. And it kind of became somewhat of an obsession of, um, of ours in the coming years. So in that time in our own studio, we've gradually assembled tools. We've forged alliances with others to, to pull and bring together a range of equipment. And we're acting on this feeling that, that making, you know, physically making, is not something that is done by someone else. And it's not something that's remote, but it's something that can be uh, immediate. So, um, so putting things together yourself changes the way that you think about the urban environment. You know, architects or not, designer or not, you start to see the correlation between the thing that you make, um, which might be very small, but... The thing that you make and that is small and the thing that you see which is big, you know, they, they, share, um, they share a correlation. You realise the city and everything, all of this stuff around us is made and therefore it can be made differently as well. And the city is changeable and actually it's full of possibility. And so at Black Horse Workshop, the, the question is, how do you translate this into, you know, into something more tangible? Uh, what is a public version of this? And there's many examples of this from across the globe, a kind of public workshop, so from the men's sheds to hack spaces, which are manifesting this idea in different ways. But we're thinking more of a, you know, more of a kind of public institution, something which is more visible. And to think of it more as a public library or a gym, and to ask the question, why not make, why not take control in the same way that you read or work out, you know, as a form of, um, a form of leisure. So this place is um, a place which supports this kind of activity which embraces making as a social act and it's for the amateurs as well as the professionals. So we began to think of this workshop as an important part of the area and it's not something that's hidden in an industrial estate. And this area is one that's undergoing rapid change. It's one in which industry and creative practitioners are being pushed out of as London expands inexorably. So it's clear there's a lot at stake and we really had to kind of, you know, we had to look at everything. So that includes surveying the local existing provision to make sure that our proposal was not competing directly um, with what was already there. And also, we needed to know what the people who might use the workshop, how they might use it, what they might think. So we needed to talk to them. So building a wagon seems like quite a small act, but taking this then out to a shopping mall is a way of talking to people and engaging with them, um, you know, the kind of people who might not be the normal target audience for a workshop. And it's a way to start conversations, it's a way to gather information, both anecdotally, um, but also to gather information in more mundane ways and surveys and things like that. So all of this is to build up an economic case for the workshop, as well as telling the story, as well as making this place. And so we needed to give the workshop the best possible chance of exceeding in the long term. This idea of legacy is very important. So we set up a separate company, and we hired... Two, well, three staff actually, uh, Harriet and Toby and Rob, and that st staff group is growing. And we, we, we hired those before the opening night, and it was with them that we developed the physical design and the program. Um, and so that physical space might cater for keen makers who might want to actually have some space for the workshop. And, but there's also a pay as you go option, and there's also more structured learning courses, should you, you know, not be so confident, but you want to understand how two pieces of wood go together in the best way. And equally, you might just come to the workshop in order to go to the market or to come to the cafe and get some coffee. Um, so it's trying to embrace a spectrum of people and understand that actually um, you know, making isn't only for the gifted few. It's actually you know, it's, it's, for, it's for all of us. And so I think it's important to say at this point that Black Horse Workshop is kind of sold on the basis of being a temporary project. It was a one-year pilot and we've learned from previous projects that the opportunity of a temporary is much greater. The interim asks for less commitment. It's easier to take a risk. And so 
His expected lifespan has now been extended much beyond its first year, um, the first year mark. And so you can see this is a photograph from its first birthday. It's actually coming up to two years now, and the signs are good. So it's gained local political support at a high level, and the lease has been extended to 2019. And there's also potential to expand into the adjacent buildings next door. Um, and funding has now been secured for a new structure in the yard which should help um, expand the capacity of the workshop. And all of this goes to prove in some ways that an interim use with a longer term vision can also be an effective way of ensuring a constructive legacy is left behind for kind of so-called temporary projects. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit now uh, about our work in, in Liverpool, in Granby, um, which is an area in the south of Liverpool. Um, in its recent economic and social history, uh, a reflective of Liverpool at large. It's a once thought thriving port city that's now suffering from the symptoms of post-industrial decline. And it has a shrinking population. There's traditionally lots of unemployment and racial tension and mistrust of local government over the last two decades. Um, Granby specifically has seen several top-down regeneration schemes that propose the clearing of houses and replacing them with a lower-density typology. Um, residents have consistently opposed these plans, choosing to value many of the things that the local authority didn't particularly the buildings uh, which spoke more, of a more prosperous time in Liverpool's past. They're some of the grandest that were built in the city at the time. Um, and the sense of community and the symbolic importance of this area is one of the, cent the centre of one of the oldest kind of black populations in, in Liverpool and Europe as well. And there were two decades of demolition before the cancellation of the government's ha uh, housing pathfinder plan in 2011. Um, this left just four of the 14 streets that were originally constructed in Granby still intact. Um, but the houses on these streets still stood empty, um, boarded up and left to rot as kind of a programme of managed decline. Um, and that condition can be seen across many other areas of Liverpool and the North West in general. Um, the neighbouring Welsh streets just a few hundred yards away were a good example of that where there's still more than sort of 400 houses uh, all boarded up and empty. So a small group of residents during this period remained. Um, they resisted all of the efforts really to move them elsewhere, um, all of the offers that were made. And gradually they took responsibility for their neighbourhoods, extending very domestic actions such as cleaning and painting, planting the streets, um, out of their homes and into the public realm, occupying and animating it and kind of inviting other people in through the creation of the market and just showing a level of care in their, in their kind of environment. And in this void that was created by the demolition in the absence of authority, the locals were able to exercise an enormous amount of freedom and control. No one was really watching and no one really cared. And they established a community land trust, a kind of formal organisation with the intention of refurbishing the empty houses and maintaining them for community ownership. And what this organisation did was give them a formal structure through which the community was able to purchase the properties from the council and through which it can retain ownership of the properties and rent them out affordably, which gives them a say in the way that things will develop and change in the future. So the residents' ambition, rather than this kind of top-down vision, is to gradually build the area back up not through a single uncompromising vision, but an approach that allows many different parties, whether that's individuals or housing associations or other organisations, to all have a stake in the process of renewal. And we were appointed to help them build a case that would convince the local council to support this, to, to, to sell the houses to them, um, you know, having tried, you know, having been in conflict with these residents for, for a very long time. And the strategy was for an incremental, ground-up approach that would develop a network of projects and spaces that think at a small, kind of achievable scale. The first of those was to, to refurbish the 10 houses on Cairn Street, which is one of the four streets um, kind of still, still intact. Um, and the model for the houses is not one of straightforward restoration. So some of the houses were in very, very poor condition. There's a lot of structural issues. Floors had fallen through. In many cases, the roofs have been taken off. And, and you know, in the process of trying to speed up uh, the, the kind of justification for demolishing these houses. Um, but through a process of repair and adaptation and responding to the specific condition of each house, we try to retain and kind of take advantage of these incidents. If they could be usefully adopted to create interesting and unusual spaces, maybe that are more generous in scale or more open than would have been traditional when they were first built. And sometimes this is on a small scale in a room where the ceiling had fallen down, keeping it vaulted rather than just rebuilding it. And in larger scale spaces, such as the proposed winter garden, we sort of talked about taking the two houses that were in the worst condition, that were too costly to refurbish into homes, and appropriating them as a community greenhouse that can be enjoyed by everyone, that could host sort of artist residencies and things like that. So a shared sort of new public space that takes advantage of that. 
And the budget for these is very, very tight. It, in order to be viable, it had to be less than the equivalent cost of rebuilding the houses as new. You have to sort of beat a, a, a tax break in the UK, basically, which incentivizes new build construction. Um, so the spending is concentrated on new structure and, and good, well insulated envelopes that will be cheap for people to sort of live and maintain in the future. So the materials, generally speaking, were very standard, and the finishes very standard too, so that the work could be carried out by local builders at, at standard rates. But each house is also furnished with a small number of highly bespoke and handmade elements. So there's mantle pieces, which kind of the symbolic heart of the home. Uh, sort of ceramic door handles and knobs, polished concrete uh, kitchen worktops, and abstract pattern tiles. All of these things which are designed to recall the kind of character and craft and the level of care that was invested in these properties originally and their sort of Victorian crafts that contributed to, to their sort of rich interior qualities. And from the start, we were interested in how this process of rebuilding the neighbourhood, starting with these ten houses, could support the rebuilding of the social infrastructure of the area as well. How it could create new opportunities in an area where, at that time, there, weren't many, that, you know, there, there aren't that many. Um, and so we set up Granby Workshop as a social enterprise in one of the local empty shop units. So the workshop trains and employs a team of locals to make the products for the first ten houses, but also for the next phases of the project as it kind of develops. Um, and these products are available for sale online. And we were nominated for the Turner Prize last year, um, which gave a great platform, really good opportunity to provide uh, a kind of, you know, use the surge of public interest in our work to boost the Granby project and support the local culture of creativity that had been such a big part of the residents taking ownership and initiating like, the renewal that was taking place in Granby. So we built a showroom in the gallery where visitors could view the full range of products, all of which can be ordered online and enable many different people to invest in the changes that are taking place there. So these are the, some of the products that are still, uh, still for sale, ranging from sort of chairs to these, these kind of original range of things which form uh, part of the fabric of the, the new homes. Um, the products are all evidently handmade. There's an emphasis on using processes which typically invite chance, improvisation and experimentation, which means that every product is a bit different by design. The production itself is a kind of playful and creative act, so these are sawdust uh, ceramic candles. They're made from, from clay using a two-pot mould, then fired in a barbecue in the yard with wood chip. Um, and you can throw in things like banana skins or coffee beans or whatever. You know, anything you kind of put in there changes slightly the way that those things will come out. Um, there are a series of items, quite sort of uh, standard uh, household fixtures, tables, lampshades and things, which are made from quite cheap construction materials like cement board. Um, that are then marbled, which is a very simple, traditionally a paper, tech, uh, paper marbling technique, which we've applied to kind of construction materials. Uh, this is a range called the turned and burned uh, furniture, which um, is lathed timber legs, quite a simple process to learn, um, with very simple kind of joints and things. Um, and then they're blackened with a blowtorch. Um, this is, these are Granby Rock uh, kind of lights and bookends and things, the same material as the mantelpieces, which these kind of larger items you typically have a, a bit of stuff left over at the end. So it was creating a range of smaller things which could only use this material rather than waste it. So they're cast in coloured pigments using reclaimed materials from the area's old buildings as aggregates, which, um, which are exposed when the pieces are polished up. So in the long term, the ambition is for the workshop to grow and develop skills through training and creating employment opportunities. This should hopefully create, promote a confidence in the area's younger people that they have the capacity to affect change in their neighbourhood. And it's been pretty extraordinary for us as a group working within this context for the last two years. And in a place like Granby, creativity isn't just a supplement or a luxury. It's really part of people's everyday reality. You know, the work of the residents that we've been able to help extend has demonstrated the potential for creative projects and direct ways of working that can be a real force for positive change in difficult environments. And we're still working in Liverpool on projects like the Winter Garden and longer-term plans to bring back uses to the high streets and corner shops that have been empty for the last few years. Hopefully in these projects we've described and others, I mean, we, we've learned a lot about the different demands and tactics that might bring results in, in different situations. I think in all of our projects, the limits of our role and the importance of building constructive relationships with the people and the places we're involved in is critical to really enable others to take ownership, to make the decisions that will shape a place in the longer term. We've learned a lot also about the agency, that the directness of making and doing things can enable just getting on with it. You know, we've seen this at work in the projects we visited on our short time in Hong Kong on this trip. 
And we hope that the work we've shown tonight can promote that idea and small, you know, that small and positive actions can contain the potential to enact real and positive changes at a much larger scale. Thanks very much. <laughs> <laughs>